focusing on the three key drivers when it comes to the market, we continue to look at the COVID curve and the flattening of the curve, the pace and sustainability of the economic recovery, and then finally policy implementation. Looking at the first driver, China to date has been relatively successful in terms of containing any future or flare-ups that we've seen relating to the COVID virus. More recently, we did see an outbreak in Beijing, which was contained very, very quickly and efficiently. Other outbreaks around other provinces in China, again, due to the Chinese government's tracking, monitoring and containment methods, we haven't seen the virus really escalate to levels that we did see in the first quarter. So therefore the pressure on the healthcare system, we feel, isn't going to be as severe as again, what we saw in the first quarter. So in effect, regarding this first driver, China does get a tick. In terms of the second driver, the recovery from an economic perspective. Yes, we did see a downturn in terms of GDP for the first quarter, but then second quarter GDP surprised on the upside, and we do expect positive growth in both the third and fourth quarter, which should, should see China all up deliver positive growth a lot stronger than the rest of the world. When we look further in terms of the economy as a whole, PMI data has turned positive. We certainly have been speaking to a number of corporates whereby utilization rates are back up to normal levels. When it comes to the consumer and the services sector, a little bit more of a mixed bag. So in certain areas or subsectors, you are seeing demand pick up again. So take autos, for example. That whole story about premiumization is still intact. So brands such as BMW, Lexus, seeing good sales volumes coming through. From more of a services perspective, over 90% of restaurants have reopened, but the traffic is still around 10 to 30% lower than what we have seen or pre-COVID days. The area that is struggling though relates to tourism. And whilst we are again seeing domestic tourism levels pick up, the need or the availability to travel overseas or international travel, again, really at levels that we haven't seen for some time. Having said that, when you look at passport issuance across the country, mid-teens in terms of the overall population has passports. So the long-term tourism story does still remain intact, but again, it's all very dependent on restrictions in terms of travel being eased as well as Chinese tourists or consumers once again feeling confident enough to travel. Which takes me to policy implementation. We have been discussing over the year that the Chinese government has somewhat bucked the trend from other central bankers. They haven't necessarily thrown everything they've got in terms of, in terms of ensuring that the economy does in fact recover. So from a monetary policy perspective, they were in easing mode. They're probably more in sort of the neutral stance now, or taking a neutral stance. When it comes to fiscal policy, very much waiting to see what the data shows and tweaking where they need to. Property, surprisingly, has surprise on the upside. So seeing good numbers coming out of top tier as well as second tier cities. And with property remaining fairly buoyant or sentiment remaining very strong still, the second derivative is, is of course spending. So whether again, as you see people urbanize, upgrading, home appliances still remain very attractive in terms of the purchasing item for Chinese society. So when you take all these three key drivers, we're not too surprised at how the market has behaved. Chinese equities being one of the best performing equity markets as well as asset classes year to date. However, we are thinking that the market, because it has risen so much, might be a little bit complacent about the overarching risks still, one of the key risks being export related. So just because Chinese demand has recovered doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see global demand pick up at the same kind of pace. And of course, we cannot ignore geopolitical concerns at this point in time. We do expect an escalation of somewhat tensions between China and the US leading up to the, the, the November elections.
and our thesis regarding the changing relationship between the US and China. It's gone from a very collaborative relationship to a very competitive relationship. Well, regardless of who does win the US elections, we do feel that you're going to get this or going to continue to see this competitive nature really play out over the next several years. So at times, periods of volatility relating to how these countries are playing off one another. Whilst we could argue that China certainly has done well, if we look at those three prongs. So again, the flattening of the COVID curve, the pace of its economic recovery, and policy implementation and direction. We also need to be mindful that China can't exist in isolation from the rest of the global economies. Worth noting that more recently, we have seen in the state media, the Chinese government really focusing on this new phrase called dual circulation. And essentially what this means is that there's a big focus on ensuring that the domestic economy and growth within the domestic economy does pick up and is sustainable, which benefits the Fidelity China Fund, given that most of the revenue and earnings that are derived from the underlying companies are focused on the domestic economy itself. But this dual circulation term, it also encompasses how the government is looking at the supply chain to make sure that there are no significant disruptions, primarily due to the rising geopolitical environment we find ourselves in. Additionally, it's not just the China-US trade relationship or relationship that investors should be mindful of. And whilst it does definitely gain a lot of traction, especially in the headline news, most countries are probably in the midst of reassessing their trade relations with others, especially given the new world order that we find ourselves in. So really, in summary, we do expect that the Chinese equities market will do well, both in an absolute as well as a relative sense versus other markets. And this is really underpinned by the opportunities we still find in the market. Nothing does go up in a linear fashion. The market has been strong. There are associated risks. But a lot of those structural stories and themes, the rising consumption story, the fact that the PBOC or Chinese government officials still have the tool set should they need to support areas in terms of the economic recovery. And really importantly, the rise of the investor base in China and their influence on the markets, as well as the opening up of the capital markets and reforms that the Chinese officials have been putting in place. And lastly, that focus that we have in terms of improving governance and how the Chinese companies, very contrarian thought, can deliver attractive income, a bit like the Australian market, in terms of the yields that some of the state-owned enterprises are indeed offering. China's bucked the trend both in terms of policy response, and by that I mean it hasn't been as aggressive as other central banks in terms of stimulus measures. But it's also about the trend in terms of how companies are looking at rewarding minority shareholders. This year, across a number of markets, we've seen very well-known income-paying companies either suspend or slash their dividend yields. China's gone the other way. Now, the dividend story in China is very contrarian. Most people look at China as highlighted this year for the growth opportunities, tapping into the consumption story. But over the years, we've seen more and more of an emphasis coming through from the regulators for Chinese companies to really reward minority shareholders through increasing the dividend payout. Think of the Australian market and how investors really look for that total return strategy. So not just capital appreciation, but also income levels, which is why Australia remains such a well-known market for the, its dividend yield. If China can get to a similar position in terms of that focus, it bodes well, not just for Australian investors or UK investors, but also for mainland investors. 
Jing's had a thesis for many, many years now in terms of what we are seeing from a structural perspective. As we see the households becoming wealthier, as we see more and more progress in terms of pension reform, households are going to see additional capital come into their household. But where does the capital go? From an asset allocation perspective, your opportunity set's quite limited in China. Cash, and like the rest of the world, the yield is low because of the low yielding environment we live in. Property has restrictions given policy and from the top of the government, uh, messaging that property is where you live, it shouldn't be used for investment purposes. So with the equities market, yes, historically, we've seen the retail part of the mainland market being very momentum driven, still a little bit like this in terms of the style bias, but improving somewhat. But if you therefore ask or change the mindset of domestic investors and look at equities from a long-term perspective, and again, like Australia, that total return focus, deriving income from the companies or equities you own, then it's up to the corporates themselves to make sure they deliver sustainable or attractive dividends through their policies. So this is an area that we are seeing really, really interesting results. And again, engagement with the companies we are seeing a change in dividend policies for the better. So the dividend yield on the fund is about double that of the benchmark. We expect this to continue, given again this focus on rewarding minority shareholders. The Chinese equities market has really been driven or supported by certain sectors and certain names within those sectors. If you recall 2019, was a year where high growth, large cap names were certainly favored both by local mainland investors as well as foreign investors who were adding to their Chinese allocation due to A shares or China listed companies being incorporated in a number of indices, MSCI as well as FTSE. As a result of this very narrow rally though, you started seeing these well-loved names trading at really rich multiples. So going into 2020, the thought process was high growth has done very, very well, but we could see a mean reversion into the more value or old economy or defensive part of the Chinese market. However, when we did start seeing the COVID situation emerge and restrictions being put in place in terms of lockdown in China, Instead of, again, China following other markets and the flight to quality trade or moving into the defensive sectors, becoming defensive in China resulted in people buying more and more of those well-loved names. What we have seen year to date is growth trading once again at very extreme levels versus value. And within the growth segment, again, these large cap well-loved names usually relating to the consumer sector, usually relating to the e-commerce sector, and also in the biotech space. Given the portfolio manager, Jing Ning's investment style of being very value and very contrarian, the last couple of years in terms of performance and the market dynamics haven't suited her. So when you look at the portfolio, her exposure to old economy names, her exposure to state-owned enterprises and being underweight, those very popular segments, so again, e-commerce and biotech, has weighed on the fund and performance, as you can see here. Really interesting to note, though, that from a style perspective, so outside of underlying stock selection, because of her value contrarian style bias and being short momentum, it's really impacted the performance of the fund. So what to do in such a, an environment? Well, as a portfolio manager, management has made it very clear that fund managers who have such a style bias need to maintain their process. She's very cognizant of ensuring, along with our analysts, that the companies that she does own are still performing in terms of delivering earnings, implementing their strategy. So at this point in time, it still remains a market where her names, despite the reporting that they're doing, despite the dividend yields that they're paying, are just merely being overlooked because you have this very concentrated market rally.
What could be the catalyst to change this? Well, at times we have seen a slight rotation into value. We have begun to see a cyclical economic recovery underpinned by again infrastructure investment and other fiscal policies put in place by the Chinese government. And whilst this is translated into a cyclical value name recovery, it's been very short lived. So what we do expect to see is usually when you have a cyclical recovery in China, you see the cyclical value names outperform or start to do well, and then the defensive names in terms of the value basket start also doing better. So again, it's this wait and see approach. There is such a vast amount of liquidity in the market, but when you look at some of these e-commerce names, despite being good companies, they're trading at multiples close to 300 times forward PE. And again, as a contrarian value investor that does not fit her process or her investment philosophy. Now, a knock-on effect regarding the geopolitical situation between the US and China has seen a number of very well-known names either come back and do a dual listing in Hong Kong or do new listings in Hong Kong, China. So Alibaba, JD.com, NetEase, they've all got dual listings now in the US as well as Hong Kong. And more recently, Ant Financial, which is the financial services arm of Alibaba, has announced that they're going to do an IPO in Hong Kong, as well as a Star Bourse. Now, the Star Bourse is in Shanghai, and essentially, it's like the NASDAQ. It only just recently celebrated its one-year anniversary, but to date, we've seen about 165 companies either come to market or are in the process of their IPO and coming to market. In terms of why this is important and why we are seeing this shift, and the importance, once again, of the investor base in China itself is that Chinese companies don't need to now go to the US to gain sort of traction or liquidity because liquidity is being found in this part of the world. And what does this mean for foreign investors? Again, what does this mean for Australian investors? Well, it means more and more opportunities are coming about. Yes, not every company is investable from our perspective, Yes, not every company in terms of from a value contrarian investment process will make it into the portfolio, but it highlights again this growth of, of, of new participants in the market. And really importantly, it also encourages, and we again are seeing this with the companies we're meeting, encourages this improving corporate governance. Well, China isn't like the Australian market, so value investing doesn't mean just owning utilities or telecommunication names or banks. Value investing, from Jin's perspective, is that we can find value across all sectors. So, for example, even within e-commerce, you can identify value names. Even in consumer discretionary, again, you can identify value names. What's key for her? Uh, potential turnaround situations. So again, names that are being overlooked, but have some kind of fundamentals or industry issue that will see their earnings or market share ever increase. And again, that dividend story remains really attractive and often found in this part of the market. Again, the part of the market that's really unloved at the moment because momentum and growth is gaining all the attention.